Thank you, Jeff. Uh, again, I'm Kathleen Casey Gomez. I'm a senior policy analyst at TIDC, and I'm really excited to work with this panel here today on rural defenders because I myself am from a small town in a different state. Can we get a show of hands? How many folks here are from a small a rural community? All right, we got a bunch of people here today. So the idea is that we're going to talk about what's working, what's practical, it's after lunch. Every panel that's right after lunch has to mention that they're the panel right after lunch. Um, so we've, we've checked that box off, which is great. Uh, but as you have questions, raise your hand and someone other than me for once will bring you the microphone, which will be great. But we want this to be useful. We want you to learn about these success stories that we have. So we're really grateful to this panel. So if y'all want to go ahead and we'll just start here with James, just briefly introduce yourself and then we have a, a couple questions to work through. I'm James McDermott. I'm the chief public defender of the Far West Texas Regional Public Defender. Uh, I'm based in Alpine and we cover five rural counties from uh, Brewster County to Husbeth County. Uh, I follow my district court judge and basically circuit. My turn. My name is Roy Ferguson. I am the district judge of the 394th Judicial District. Uh, that is a district that covers those five counties. Uh, you heard earlier it's about <coughs> 20,000 square miles. Uh, we have 25,000 people spread out over those. Uh, and we even have a county that's about 1,500 people in population. Uh, we created the Public Defender Office in 2017, and we've had one full year of full-time operation under our belt uh, that we've worked with the, uh, the commission uh, to put some numbers together. So hopefully we can give you some meaningful information, take the mis mystery out of creation of one of these systems for rural counties, give you some good news for a change. Thank you. My name is Jim Huff. At home, I'm known as a village idiot, so don't expect a whole lot of smart things out of me. County Judge in Live Oak County, we're located midway between San Antonio and Corpus Christi. In 2009, we contracted uh, uh, with on an 80 uh, 20 grant with Texas Rio Grande legal aid we formed one of the first I think the first uh, regional public defenders group or office uh, and it's working very well we're definitely rural about 12,500 in population energy is our mainstay and our program for the three counties I think uh, we're, we're very very proud of it I'm Michelle Ochoa. I'm a public defender with Texas Rio Grande Legal Aid. We are a small public defender program. We currently service 10 rural counties in Texas. Thank you. So the first thing I want to talk about today, and I'll address this to the judges on the panel, can you describe what your system was like before the public defender? And whoever would like to start. The, when I took the bench in 2013, we had a system in place that had been there about 20 years. Uh, my predecessor was on the bench for 20 years. And as you know, some things changed uh, technologically over those 20 years. And one of the first things I did when I took the bench, and I've heard Edwin tell this story, was call the commission. Uh, I knew nothing about the appointment system that was in place, and I really wanted to know what my job was. Uh, I knew that we had 12 lawyers or so that covered the five counties. Uh, and as I understood, and for the judges in the room who appoint counsel, the, the way that I evaluated appointment of counsel was, would I hire this lawyer to defend me if I were arrested and charged with that crime? That's the standard that we should apply when we decide whether someone should be defending anyone on our order. And going through the system, I realized I didn't have very many of those uh, at my disposal in this rural area. So the first thing we did was set up a tiered system where if they had a certain number of qualifications, they could do state jail, third, second, first. Uh, but even that was not working. And it got to the point where I didn't have lawyers at all <clears throat> for certain cases. If I had a first degree felony, I had two lawyers that I thought were qualified to do it. Uh, you can, that's untenable in an area where we get six or 700 felony indictments a year. I can't give them all to two people. So at that point, uh, in June of 17, I reached out to uh, Edmund Colfax. Hey. Two weeks later, they went in front of the commission with a, a proposal for a, a grant. Uh, they approved it. 
we set up the office, we hired them in October, and in December they were operational. So now, in, that's great, and we're going to talk more in detail about <clears throat> how that was implemented. But what I'm hearing from what you said was that there was a problem just simply finding lawyers in the first place. Is that right? No question. And do you think that's a you, you know, is that something that's common in rural areas, simply just finding lawyers to do the cases? I, I, I would have to ask the other judges. I see some heads nodding. Yeah. In my five counties, I had two counties with no lawyers. Is that, None. Is that something that y'all are facing? I see a lot of head nods here, just simply finding people to do the work. Yeah. Okay. okay. And Judge Huff, how about you? <clears throat> yes. I was sworn into office January 1st of 1987, and indigent defense really didn't mean a lot to me at the time. I kind of had an idea of what my responsibilities were, but being located midway between San Antonio and Corpus Christi and not having attorneys locally or even close that wanted to take a court appointment, I mean, realistically, who wants to drive from San Antonio 80 miles for a couple of Class B misdemeanors? So I had a short list. Uh, it became very, I would say, unmanageable, even with a short list it became very expensive um, and I was not really satisfied with the quality of representation that these indigent defendants were getting. <clears throat> That's why in 2009 when we contracted, got indigent defense commission on an 80-20 grant helped us out and we contracted with TRLA. I think that was probably the first time that I could go home at night and think that I had met that obligation. So there's two things I'm hearing, and again, you know, I'd, I'd love to hear y'all just say yes, no, depending on if this applies to you as well. But one of the things I'm hearing is distance. Just simply, is that something that some other rural areas are finding, that the distance that people might have to travel? Yes. yes. Okay. And then, There's yes, one Judge. other thing that factors in that will matter to the people in this room. Yes. The uncertainty of budgeting when you do the ad hoc appointments, particularly when everyone comes from out of town, it's impossible for you to accurately predict to my county judges and commissioners here what that budget item should be. Uh, I had one county with a budget of $8,000 a year. One trial, that's gone. Yep. One wow. appeal, it's history. Um, we had one county with a $43,000 budget total for appeals and, and all appointments. They had a, a big name murder trial. You may have heard of Zuzu Verk, the college student who was killed. The legal fees in that case alone are $150,000. Wow. That's one case that's just the lawyer. We haven't even gotten all the other expenses yet. I understand the court reporter's cost is going to be $30,000. So how can you budget, county judges, how can you budget in a meaningful way when one trial or one death or three convictions in jury trials completely destroy your budget? We had one county with every lawyer coming from out of town because there's no lawyers in Hudspeth County. 50 indictments a month. Do the math on how many lawyers I need. They were being paid $200 flat rate, no mileage for each felony case they resolved. Is that fair? I hope everyone says no. Even those, yep. of, you, even those of you who write the checks have to acknowledge <laughs> That's not fair. This is an interactive panel. We want to hear from y'all. Is that fair? Kathleen. Yes. Um, I was actually in private practice on the appointment panel before I came to the public defender's office. I was on the felony court appointment list for Live Oak County, but I couldn't afford to be on Judge Huff's misdemeanor appointment. And then the other thing that we, I would have to do is I would start out in Corpus Christi, make all my court appearances there, and then go out to the rural county. So I wasn't hitting district court nine I, court would start at 9, but I wouldn't show up until 11, 11.30, sometimes not even until the afternoon. And so, again, something that we saw, I mean, it was unsustainable to get any work done out in our, in our counties. So a couple things I'm hearing here, budgeting, distance, finding people to do the work, those all are interrelated, right? Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that can be sometimes uncomfortable to talk about is the quality <clears throat> that we have broached here. Are there other things I'm missing that are kind of common, unique challenges that rural communities face? Well, there's no ability to, I don't want to use the word punish, I'm not sure what word to use, but let me ask you, when you had lawyers not show up because for $200 or whatever you were paying them, they weren't going to miss a paying hearing and they'll just not show up. But you've only got a few who are willing to come. 
what did you do when they wouldn't show up for court? But if you, if you show cause them, they're just going to say, you know what? I'm never coming back, and now you're one lawyer down. Yes. In fact, they didn't come back. <laughs> you're exactly right and what I ended up doing was shifting it to the few that right. would mm -hmm. you know and you can solve maybe a little bit of that in my opinion by scheduling and rather than it be two class B misdemeanors no you've got 10 cases mm -hmm. but you, you you end up wearing out the people that you depend upon and not always was that quality of representation I think at the level that it should have been so We've kind of identified some issues, and it sounds like there are issues for other people here in the audience. I want to talk at the end of our hour here today about the nuts and bolts of how y'all actually like went about setting it up. Because again, I want this to be practical, you know. But before we get there, we talked about before. So now tell us what it was like now that for both of y'all, these systems are set up. And then, you know, feel free, you know, James and Michelle to kind of chime in about what your day is like. Can I start? Yeah. Sure, Please. you bet. Um, I had been a public defender in different offices for about 10 years mm -hmm. before I moved out to, or 12 years before I moved out to Alpine. Um, and I knew some of the problems that come in with public defenders and ways that courts can sometimes feel like maybe they're not getting a service or the, certainly defendants think that sometimes they're getting a cut rate lawyer. Um, it was very important for me when I set up this office that what we were doing is addressing those basic concerns. Um, Judge Ferguson and my misdemeanor courts both, they've always got a lawyer, and the lawyer's at the beginning of court. The docket has been gone over probably with probation before they show up. We have negotiated with the state before the judge gets on the bench. Um, we're ready for everything. When they schedule us, we're there. Um, probation is, knows what's going on and who's going on in probation. Um, the judge knows that if, um, that if there's something that he wants to give feedback to, um, that there's somebody to, to talk to. And I've got employees and you know somebody might have a bad day. And the judge can come to me and say, this is what was going on with your office. Do you think there's something that needs to be addressed? Um, and so he can have some sort of feedback, appropriate feedback that is difficult to do with the private bar. Um, because he's got access to me and then I can sort of deal with it internally. Um, there are, the basic commitment I made to the counties when I took this job was that their work was going to get done. Their cases were not going to get ignored. People were not going to sit in jail. Judges were going to have lawyers show up to court every time on time. Um, and I, it, beyond the part that actually makes me do the work, which is I love doing public defense and I love representing people, um, there's an important part of it which means that the, the work of the courthouse gets done. Um, and it's always, I think we've maybe missed one, we missed one docket because it was two hours away from our office and I got sick on the way. And that's the only docket in two years that we've missed. That's excellent. How about for y'all? How have things changed since? <clears throat> I think they changed definitely for the better. You know, if you look at in the county court of Live Oak County, Rural area, about 12,500, but high traffic volume. We have US uh, 281, US 59, 37. That's where our cases basically come from. And I would also say that probably 70% of the defendants in my courtroom, most of them come off the, the roadway, um, are indigent. Uh, many of them don't even understand what they're charged with. May sound funny, but <laughs> I mean, we're starting at the basics here. Um, many are immigrants. Uh, many are non-English speaking. Uh, of course, we hit on a, a really, really important uh, area when we talk about mental health. So I, I get some people that are in need of, of mental health services. Uh, but now it's much, much more streamlined. I like having uh, a public defender in the courtroom for appointments that are made that day. <clears throat> Again, at the county court level, what I have found is not everybody wants to drive back to beautiful George West, Texas in a month for their next court date. So let's just plead guilty, let's get in, let's get out, and then they don't understand the repercussions of what their plea agreement was from other, because, due to action by other agencies that now kick in. So um, 
ours is definitely streamlined. They keep the docket moving. Um, it, it, it's a win-win situation, in my opinion. Thank you. That's excellent. You wanted to say something? One thing, two things came to mind. One, we forgot to mention jail population. Yes, tell us a little um, bit about that. Has it changed? Uh, it was one of the reasons, one of the things we talked about at the very beginning. And what we were seeing was lawyers are supposed to, when they get notice of appointment, talk to their client within 24 hours. It was never happening. And we were seeing people come to court three months later, having never spoken to a lawyer, not even know that maybe they had a lawyer appointed, and they've been sitting in jail for over 90 days. <clears throat> which all of y'all should immediately know that's a problem, right? Um, we had people that were sitting in jail without ever talking to their lawyer, and they had a mandatory probation charge. So they shouldn't be in jail at all, right? Uh, so one of the things we talked about, and we set up this remote video conferencing system in all of our jails, is I made clear when we hired uh, Mr. McDermott, they were going to communicate with every single person immediately. And so we set it up, our jails are four hours apart sometimes, so we set it up so that in their office, they have a monitor that connects directly to a secure confidential area in each jail. And if I get a, an email of an application, I will appoint the PDO, email it over to them, he gets it on his phone, someone in their office hits into the system, calls the jail, they bring in the defendant, and they confer right then. So if there is someone who's being held without bond mm -hmm. for no reason, which does happen in these small towns, mm -hmm. some of the magistrates will just no bond somebody for a state jail felony, nothing charged. Uh, they know what to do. They can go back to the magistrate mm -hmm. and say, he, he gets a bond right now. Um, so our jail population, the staleness of people in jail has dramatically come down. And we have had the horror stories, I'm sure you've had too, of people who get lost in the jail and we had one who was there for nine months. He was never charged, so it never came to my attention that he was even there because there was no indictment. And uh, we found out because my coordinator said, I want a current jail list right now. I want everything on it. And she found this poor guy. Well, he didn't speak English. And as far as he knew in Mexico, this is how it worked. You got picked up by the government and you went into jail and that was it. And so he didn't think he had any rights. Those things don't happen anymore when you have a public defender who is ready to meet them as soon as they get appointed. And actually, I was about sure. to throw it to you, Michelle, real quick. Can I, can I follow up with that real quick? Yeah, go for it. Um, so practically, on the other end, what happens is Judge Ferguson's court coordinator emails my office. Uh, my secretary gets that. Uh, the rule in the office is same business day. If they're not in jail, they get a phone call. There's an immediate contact from the office. The person knows who their lawyer is. This also means for his office, um, in the past, people, and still people will call and say, what's happening with my lawyer? I don't know what's going on. She knows exactly who to send them to. Uh, she can just say, she doesn't have to look up. She says, call the public defender. If it turns out it might not be ours, then we figure it out for her. She's not running around figuring out who somebody's lawyer is and what's going on with them. I take it from there. If they're in jail, we keep a board in our office. All of our inmates stay on the board. We make sure we know how long they've been in, what their charge is, um, whether or not we think we've, we've filed a writ or justification. We have regular meetings to go over why, if we've not filed a writ to get somebody out of jail, that we've justified internally that there's a reason. For example, somebody may not be eligible because they've gotten out of state hold. Well, we have a question. Randy. What's the total population of your district, Roy? 25,000. Five towns. And what's your budget? For your PD. Uh, right now, I think we're about uh, $550,000. And most of that is covered by the commission. They cover 100% of the investigator. <coughs> they cover 100% of the health, mental health social worker. They covered 100% of the video conferencing system. And they cover 67% of everything else. Roughly. Roughly. <laughs> yeah, so I just did that. The counties are paying, um, I think, Total of that budget, the counties are paying more or less around 150000 between the five counties. And that's for five employees? Six? Six. Six, six now. In the, in the department. All right. That's a great question. Michelle, tell us a little bit about the services that you provide. 
Um, it's similar to what you've been hearing, and the additional okay. service that we do is we, my investigators actually get that jail log every day, and they're monitoring the jail list. So if there's somebody new that hits the jail, we make sure we go over there. Have you requested your court-appointed lawyer? If you haven't, here, let's get an affidavit filled out, and we get it to the appropriate appointing authority, and then that's where we've already created the initial um, attorney-client relationship. So if somebody's in jail, let's say there's a conflict case, and so we get one of them, and then the court-appointed lawyer gets the second one. We're watching if they're hitting their 15, 30, or 90 days, and we'll let the judges know, hey, you know, our Cody's sitting in jail, and it passed 90 days. And then the judges call the attorney, hey, you need to file a writ on this guy. Um, but, and, and we work closely with the judges, so Judge Huff will always get phone calls from our staff, hey, this guy's at 15, this guy's at 30, and, and Judge Huff's, Huff's working on the PR bonds to get them out of the jail if their cases haven't been filed. I think that's something that um, might be a little bit different between uh, my program and James's program, that we actually are worse in, tasked with monitoring that jail population. That's one of our services. That's excellent. So, you know, going off of this question a little bit, we talked about budget, Budgets weren't really predictable under the old system. Now, let's talk a little bit about what it's like now with budgeting, planning. Why don't you start, Judge? Uh, well, the, the counties certainly have more, they have more certainty. I don't want to say certainly have more certainty, but they have a better idea of what the cost is going to be. There are still some variables. Uh, if you get a multiple co-defendant case, the public defender office can only take one of those. And so we had a sweep one time that picked up 46 people in a drug sweep across the district. It's a lot of people. We don't have 46 lawyers. Uh, so the public defender got one, and then I brought in lawyers from El Paso, San Angelo, Del Rio, uh, Midland, Odessa, everyone we could find uh, to get that covered. Each of those still have to be paid. Uh, so there's going to be some costs there. Um, one of the biggest savings is in appeals from jury trials. Because when you have court-appointed counsel and there's a conviction at a jury trial, they get a free appeal, basically. They get to appeal. And if you have appointed someone and you're paying them, you have to appoint a lawyer and pay them to do the appeal, which could be up to $10,000, I think, El Paso's. Um, I've had one that high. It was an El Paso lawyer, by the way. They just gave me the cap of what y'all, <laughs> they're just used to that amount. Um, but. If you have a year like we've had where you try 15 cases and there's nine convictions or 10 convictions, that's 10 appeals. So if your budget's $30,000, you're looking at 90 grand on the appeals, not including the cost of trial. With the public defender office, there's no cost for those appeals. They're all subsumed in the cost of running the office. So from 100 grand to zero is the savings that you see. Um, it has been a dramatic savings in cost. I do know that we had one county that the year before had a $40,000 budget and came in around 80, upper mm -hmm. 70s. Uh, now all they're really paying is their share of the public defender and then we wait and see if there are conflicts. Mm -hmm. So I think for, for budgeting purposes, it is so superior to the cross your fingers, pray you don't have a murder. <laughs> I, I, I hope that just in general, but also in budgeting. <laughs> The good. small county people here know exactly what right? I'm talking yeah, about. Pray right? there's not a murder, and, and please, if it's capital, I'm just going to resign yeah. because we can't afford it, right? We have to yeah. fire all our employees to, to do a capital case. Yeah. Judge Huff, how about you? <clears throat> yes, um, I, I've seen the same positive effect with, uh, when you talk about budgeting. Again, ours is a three-county regional area. Uh, it's based on population. Uh, B County uh, has the most population. Uh, B County <clears throat> also serves as the administrator for the program. Uh, I, we are currently enjoying, I think, a 63-34% split in the cost. Uh, I believe... Two-thirds. Two-thirds two -thirds funding. Two -thirds. Yep. Uh, yes, Great. and I like that. Uh, I love that. <laughs> and that's, that. that's sustaining <clears throat> now. In fact, right. I, I will have to tell you, if it was not for the Indigent Defense Commission, we would not be able to do what we're doing. I think our costs are probably 80000 or maybe a little bit more, but it is consistent. We have an advisory board. We know what's happening. We know what's coming up, um, and we would not have the program that we do delivering the services that we're able to deliver were it not for the commission's grants. Mm. 
Excellent. And we've talked, I believe Edwin's already talked about the two-thirds sustainable funding today, isn't that right, for rural regional public defenders? A little bit, he, he gave me this. So that is something, that's part of why we're having this panel today, so that you can see where rural regional public defenders are working. We have this new funding opportunity um, for folks, and myself and Scott Ehlers are working with counties right now and, and writing assessments to see if it would work for you. We didn't have anybody around. So, and actually getting to that, y'all were setting things up before our team was really even created. So I want to spend the last half of our time here together talking about the policy decisions that you had to make and, and, and what, it, what it took to get it set up in your county. So whoever wants to take that question first. You want to go first? Yeah. You go first. Oh boy, somebody got volunteered. <laughs> I need some ideas. All right. Yeah. One of the issues that we had was we're elected officials and we have to be aware that we might just legislate ourselves out of a job if we're not careful. Uh, in our area, the lawyers, and probably in every rural area, the lawyers really carry a lot of weight when it comes to judicial election, because they're the ones that see us every day, so people trust <clears throat> their opinion. If they say that's a bad judge, people are gonna believe it. Um, when I instituted the PDO, there are two kinds of lawyers in small towns. There are lawyers who can succeed anywhere, and there are lawyers that can't succeed anywhere else. So I knew there was going to be pushback when I did it because there were a lot of lawyers in these rural areas that live or die by court appointments, even at $200 a case. And let me ask, is that the same situation in any other counties out here? I see a lot of heads nodding. Okay. So when you put in a public defender office, they see it as a direct attack on their livelihood. And you have to know that the needs of your population call for that kind of a step. Uh, I just made the decision I would rather fix it and be a one-termer <clears throat> than let it go the way it was. Um, we, when we, and here's my soapbox for the judges. We get this teeny little window of opportunity to do something important. You know, we don't ascend to the bench. They give us this job and ask us to do it for maybe four years. And in the time that you have, you ought to do all the good you can do. And in the community I'm in, where it was obvious we had a problem, we had prosecutors who were sending the letters for the courts to the defendants, not a court notice, a letter from the prosecutor, and it would say, you must come to my office and meet with me before you'll be allowed to appear before the judge. When they would get there, the prosecutor gives them a waiver of counsel <clears throat> and makes them sign it so they can negotiate and then takes them into the courtroom and pleads them out. Okay. Can we, we say something? We had counties with 0% appointment okay. at misdemeanor level. Let that sink in for a second. Zero court appointed counsel at the misdemeanor level in 20% of the US-Mexico border. Something had to be done. So when you make that decision, the policy decision you're making is, is it worth it to me to do what needs to be done, whatever that is? And if the answer is yes, call Edwin. That's right. <laughs> go ahead. And I was the one who had to go in and try and fix that, um, which as you can imagine was not fun and is still an ongoing process because um, it was just wrong, but it's the way that some of these counties have been doing it for 20 years. Um, I'm lucky because I know that whatever mischief can happen, that uh, my district court judge is doing the right thing. So I'm not, gonna, I'm not out there flailing. I'm not out there alone. I'm in the courtroom alone, but I know that I've got the support of my district court judge. And that, is, that, that to me has been a really important part of this is to know that the district court wants to do it right. And so as I make decisions as the chief on how we're going to address these problems, he's not in the courtroom. He's not, he doesn't have supervisory power over the county attorneys and how that's happening. But I know that when I'm going and trying to fix it, that I've got the support of my district court judge and that has been key <clears throat> to any change that I've made out there. You know, the biggest impediment to making a change that has this much impact is the way it's always been done. I must have heard that a thousand times, mostly from county attorneys. 
well, I don't want to do it that way. This is the way it's always been done, and it's been fine. Well, yeah, but you just pled a guy out to a, his second DWI, and he has no idea what that means and didn't get to talk to a lawyer. Yeah, but it's always been done this way. So that, would you agree that that, that kind of <coughs> lack of momentum is what stops people from doing this? Yeah, tell us about how it went for y'all. I wish I could say that it was my idea, <laughs> but it wasn't. Um, our district judges, uh, three county regional indigent uh, defense uh, group, three district judges serve those three counties and two others. Uh, it was actually the district judges and the commission who years ago came and said, you know, we think we've got a plan that can help you. Uh, strong, it was strongly supported by the district judges and still is. Um, it was not, there was not any pushback from local attorneys thinking they were going to get cut out. In fact, they probably would contribute uh, to the pot to make it work. Uh, but it, it's just run really, really well. Um, what are the questions? Anything else that I forgot? No, you're, everybody's doing great. Um, I'm sorry. All right. For so <laughs> I guess, you know, getting more into the policy, getting more into how it's run day to day, I, I want to get into that. But before that, I think we're in a really interesting thread here about the opposition you might hear. Has anyone else heard it's always been done before as a way to or use? I mean, let's be honest. Have we not all used that, too? when we don't want to do something, I do. Um, I say it all the time. Right, like precedent is actually quite important. But um, I guess for anyone on the panel, how, were there any things that stood out to your mind in building support for this idea or getting people to buy in? Were there any people that were opposed to it that changed their mind? Um, have you had anybody kind of come by later? I see Michelle nodding, so go ahead. What kind of story do you have for us? I think um, our clerks, really realize that we're there to assist the process. We'll help make sure judgments are right. We'll help make sure jail credit's right. Um, also with the, the jail staff, I think they were very resistant at first trying to cooperate with us and work in a, in a partnership where now they know we couldn't get things done without that relationship. Um, so the, I think there was a lot of pushback at first, like, oh, who are you? You're just a lawyer. You wait, you know, two hours to see your client. Where now they're like, P PD, get them in, let them see their client one after another. And it, it works, and, we, and we, get work, we get our work done. I, um, I recently applied to, uh, for, the, for Crowbell Street County for, the mental, for a mental health social worker, and two of my five sheriffs wrote support letters <clears throat> for that because, as it is right now, when they have a mental health problem in their jail, before they even figure out who the person's lawyer is, they call my office and say, can you come figure this out? Can you help us fix this? Um, and to me, that has been a real sign of sort of the value that we're adding to the community beyond just the, um, the individual representation to individual people. And I think that was huge the, to, to know that the sheriffs come and rely on us to make sure that the work is getting done correctly and that they value what we're doing which is a community that really does not have a natural um, affinity for us. Right. Um, but then what will happen is it has all kinds of other fruits across our work. Um, so I think that that has been a real huge part of it. So what I'm hearing is there's some trust that's been built and that the system is working more efficiently because there's more communication. Is that right? Mm -hmm. I think so. Okay, excellent. Before I ask my next question, does anyone have questions at this point? We definitely want to know if anybody here has any thoughts on their mind? Yes. Is the, West, is the Far West Texas Regional Public Defender's Office, is it covered just the 394th Judicial District or are there other counties? Here's what it covers. It covers all five counties and every court in it, basically. So it's all five county courts on all their misdemeanors. It's the 394th. And then we have a partial overlap of the 205th out of El Paso with two of the counties up near El Paso. It covers them as well. What happens is the county commissioner's courts authorize an interlocal agreement amongst themselves, and you pick one who's going to pay everybody, and ours is Culberson County, just the one who wanted to do it. And so they enter an agreement with the other four counties to chip in, and part of that agreement is that they will give, the judges will give every case that falls into the indigency category to the PDO unless there's a conflict. 
And so that agreement covers everyone. And luckily, Judge Dominguez of the 205th was on board as well. I think everybody's been, been happy with it, but you can do it however you want. We excluded juveniles, but you can include juveniles. You can exclude misdemeanors, uh, however you want to do it. We wanted to take care of all the needs that we could, and we knew we couldn't afford a juvenile uh, defender. And so that's what we left out. How many attorneys in your office? We've got, we've got three attorneys, myself and two other attorneys. We are actually right now in docket in the 205th on cases of mine that I'm handling that are, some of them are high level felonies um, and they are being handled right now. Um, so there are three lawyers. I've got an entry level position that is handling misdemeanors, state jail felonies, a lot of them, uh, things that happen at checkpoints and he's handling all of our bond and writ issues. Um, I've got a felony lawyer who handles just about everything that comes through except that I um, will handle all the sex cases. Um, turns out sex cases are more complicated than murders. Yep. Um, so I handle all the sex cases. But beyond that, we are running right around the TIDC caseload guidelines um, and <clears throat> Uh, it's manageable for that. I think part of it is that, you know, I came to Far West Texas out of four years of a private practice. Um, one of the benefit for a lawyer, if you're worried about self-care and burnout, is that I can take a vacation. I mean, I couldn't do that in private practice. And I can come be here or I can take a vacation. Courts are still getting covered. We have another question right over here. For either of the public defenders, you all have set budgets that are contributed to by the jurisdictions. If you get one of those headline cases that you <coughs> thinking of, major sex case, do the jurisdictions supplement to cover because those costs will go up in terms of experts, resources, et cetera, or how does that work? And before you answer that, let me repeat it just in case, because I was sitting in the corner over there and I couldn't hear too well. You, if you get a headline case or something out of the ordinary, how do you handle that budgetary-wise? So I can answer a threshold for me. I, Michelle's had longer time. Her office exists longer. Um, one is that I still go to the court for money for experts. Um, we don't pay that out of my own budget. Um, before I took this job, when I was being interviewed, one of the topics was um, issues like if there needed to be a change of venue. Um, and I think Judge Ferguson had concerns that were based on actual history and fact of lawyers maybe not following closely the ethics guidelines about pretrial publicity and how that can, how a lawyer can create the need for a transfer of venue and the costs that are associated to county for that. We've not really, the, all the cases that have had to been transferred out of our county have been filed pre my office. We've not dealt with that problem yet. Um, but it is something that we're aware of and we don't, I don't know that we right now have a plan for how to address that except that there might be a time we'd have to go to the county for a supplement, but I'm not, we've not really had that problem yet. Counties have a separate line item for those litigation related expenses. So the, if they needed an expert and filed an AKI motion, if I granted that, it's not going to come out of their budget. It's going to come out of the county's litigation supplement budget, whatever they call it. Each one has a different name for it. Ours, um, because we are not government employees, we're legal aid. So we have a contract and our contract says that we'll pay for all expert um, expenses up to $5,000 on an individual case. If we have to exceed that $5,000, then we would go back and ask the court for an AKI. So we do, we pay for all our own psyche vows. You know, if we're gonna do mitigation, we do all of that. It's already built into our contract. Okay. Any other questions? At this time? Okay. Mine probably is a really stupid question to ask, but since I don't understand the public defender office so much, I understand that the public defender's office is going to have priority. Um, <laughs> oh, you got to do it. I don't like them okay. either. I'm okay. loud enough okay. without okay. it. Okay. okay, okay, okay. All right. The public defender's office actually has priority on appointments, correct? Mm -hmm but they don't do all of the appointments for the counties? Like your five counties? I do every case unless we have a conflict of interest. Unless there's a conflict? Every case. Co-defendants. Wow. Okay, 
Well, that's what I thought I understood, but I just wanted to make sure. We do that as well, but we also do juveniles. We do every, juveniles, misdemeanors, felonies, appeals, unless there's a conflict. Wow. Okay. I'm going to pass on this. For the judge. Yes, ma'am. Has that run your docket more efficiently? No just question. having the, the defender's office. Oh, there's, there's no question. There, okay. This sounds kind of silly, but since they follow me around, there's never a conflict continuance. Right. If I set it on one of my dockets, they'll be there because I'm their district judge. I guess I was saying because of their case load. So, can I say something? I, this has been a sort of point of pride of mine. When I took this job and when I went to my first docket in December of 2017, the docket of his that I attended, I started at 9 o'clock in the morning, took a recess. This is docket call and please and arraignments. Took a recess at noon and finished sometime about 3.30 in the afternoon. Last month in that same county, we were out of there at 10.45. Yeah, we went from, well, yeah, when I took over awesome. with the backlog, there were 200 cases on a docket. Um, you know, when you, when you go digital, you can find the ones that have fallen through the sticky note cracks. Um, so we had a lot of cases to deal with. Um, right now, and this is important for y'all who think those counties are smaller than ours and therefore our numbers are too big, I need to address one thing. I have the checkpoints all along the border. We have about 21% of the U.S.-Mexico border, and I have the checkpoint of the stars on I-10 where Snoop Dogg and Willie Nelson and Fiona <laughs> Apple and Tommy Lee Jones. Um, that's they don't on qualify for a court appointed. Lawyer. I sure hope not. <laughs> <laughs> Willie might. <laughs> so uh, we're getting from that one county about 50 felony indictments a month from that one checkpoint, and I think we have 13 total all across the district. So we have a massive number of cases in these tiny little counties. Um, so I don't want you to think, well, they've got 1,500 people. How bad can it be? Yeah, it's 50 a month. Their office is probably catching 40 of those at and, least. And the, the complications with those, which I think are heightened for a private lawyer who's handling cases individually is, uh, from checkpoint cases, they're coming from all over the country. I mean, those people are not, many of them are not local. And so if we're working up mitigation or looking at mental health history or um, this, is, this involves, you know, coordinating with agencies across the country, talking to people about getting back to court from across the country. I mean, we're, we're juggling lots of things. And still, what that means is, um, you know, if we're filing continuous because somebody needs time in order to get the money to come to court, I mean, we've got a pattern now of how to communicate with the judge, how to get through the court, the court coordinator, what language to use to make sure he knows exactly which of these categories of things we're asking for, because we're asking for them the same way, the same time, is every time. And so things move, where it might take him, you know, a while to look at somebody's continuous to figure out, well, what exactly are they saying? And I don't know about this client who didn't come the last month. We've got clear communication back and forth, and, and I promise you, if I do it wrong, he lets me know. <laughs> That's judge, good to know. Judge Huffle, yeah, Judge, you, what do you think about the, you know, kind of along the same line? Go ahead. <laughs> well, we try to be predictable in the way that we handle yeah. procedure, and when you have a PDO, you can hit 80% of your court-appointed lawyers with one conference at the bench. Hey, from now on, when you bring those up, I don't want them now. I want them to give them to the bailiff before we start. Okay, Judge. I've just hit 80% of my cases and completely changed the way we do waivers of arraignment in 30 seconds rather than trying right. to send emails and letters and them not getting it for a year. Yeah. And, and the end result of that too is that the peop, other lawyers call my office to figure out how the judge wants things instead <clears throat> of trying the court coordinator and the clerk's office. Mm -hmm. They just call my office and then we tell them how it's been working now. Yeah, there's no doubt it has increased the efficiency which when you're more efficient, usually you, you save money and other resources. And some of those savings you may not always be aware of. I'm going to go back to something we talked about earlier. Something that's really, really important that's a component of Texas Rio Grande Legal Aid is we're talking about jail monitoring. And, you know, the less people that I have, I think it cost us about $40 a day per individual. The less people that I have in jail, the more cost effective the whole system is. 
And that's not something that I really, I mean, I can get the numbers on it, but that, again, goes under the umbrella of efficiency and streamlining. Uh, and with Texas Rio Grande Legal Aid, I've got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like I said, I got my list of questions, but we've got a bunch of great ones from the audience. So before I go back to that, anything else that sparked your ideas from here in our discussion up here today? Okay. Tell us a little bit about the oversight within the county, the oversight boards for the public defender offices. Um, so that's the first question I want to ask you. So anyone who, maybe we'll start down here with how TRLA works. We have an oversight committee that's governed okay. by the statute. Um, we meet usually once a quarter, and the, um, the <coughs> chief public defender is a part of that committee. And we usually just, you know, the judges will just talk to us like, hey, what's going on with our mental health guy? Everybody has their mental health, you know, what are we doing with this guy? He's always in the jail. And then we might talk about that person. How are we trying to help that person? Or um, when I was in that position, I would report, this is how many cases we currently have. This is how many cases we've closed. We might talk about, you know, we've got this non-death capital. We're going to keep it. We're going to try it. You know, like we just tried a non-death capital in um, Live Oak County, and mm -hmm. we had over 400 attorney hours on it. And that would have crushed the budget. But mm -hmm. we just absorbed it because it was already part of our process. Um, Thank you. <laughs> if um, an oversight, again, if there's any problems, the judge can call um, the chief of our each individual office, because like I said, we service 10 counties. We have a, um, a program director, and then of course we have our executive director. For, and so any one of those people can be called, and if they don't like something they're seeing, we can always adjust for them. Excellent. How about for you guys? There, we have an oversight board uh, under the statute. We, um, it includes the district court judges that in our jurisdiction, the five constitutional county judges, uh, a district court judge from out of the jurisdiction, TIDC has representation on that, and there's two local, two lawyers who practice locally who are also on that oversight board. Um, there was concern voiced to me by other people before I took this job um, that there'd be a lot of meddling. Um, and by the oversight board of what you're doing here and we want to control what you're doing there. Uh, my oversight board is all business. It's numbers, it's dollars, um, it is um, basically giving blessing to hiring decisions um, and that they leave the running of the office to me. Um, there's been, it's really just a business side of it. Um, so, uh, and I think that's been really important for independence, especially since my over by oversight board chair is also my district court judge. Um, there's a real division. I can walk in his office and talk to him about my budget. I don't walk in his office and talk to him about my cases. Um, and his door is open to me when it's about the business of my office. But when I'm a lawyer as an advocate, I'm a lawyer following all those rules. And we keep, it's been really important that we've kept that clear division. Yeah, we don't, when they come in, they don't ever talk about named anyone cases on the docket. Uh, at all, both the district judges will be in the room, and so, and, but there's no prosecutor, so there's absolutely no way he's ever going to bring up the name of anyone and tell us what he's doing. You know, if he's not doing his job right, we'll make a change, but we're not going to say, hey, we don't like the way you're handling this case. Why didn't you file this motion? You're spending too much time over here. We, you hire him. You hire the right person. You trust him to do the job. That's kind of the beauty of it, judges. Is you don't have to worry about it they're doing it. If there's a problem, you address this person. You don't address the department employees and the cases. So it's a, it's a very different setup from the way that we would supervise our coordinator or a court reporter, for mm -hmm. example. This is not that kind of relationship. Well, in building on that, uh, addressing the two public defenders on the panel, how is recruitment for your office? You know, at the beginning of this, we talked about having trouble getting lawyers to the courtroom to handle the cases. Do you have trouble getting people to work for you? Or, you know, how do you, how do, you do recruitment and how do you sell what you do to lawyers that might come work for you? We do recruitment usually through the, um, through the law schools, through the legal aid part, uh, you know, when they're doing their job fairs. I think our biggest problem is not the hiring. We do see a problem with retention. Um, 
a, a lot of the young lawyers will come out of law school, they'll want to save the world. They get into a rural community and they're like, this job's hard, I'm getting awful results, my clients are going to prison, Judges and I don't have a Starbucks. <laughs> um, and I literally, because I've been in my office now since 2011, and I've seen 12 baby lawyers. Mm -hmm. um, and I call it the Starbucks test, because it, it's hard for them, because we're in, I live in Corpus. I drive an hour to get to the office every day, because I've chosen to put my kids in that specific school. But these young ones, we don't ever have a problem. We get great candidates coming from fancy law schools, but there's and they get out of their little ivory towers and they see us in the trenches and the rural communities and it's rough. I don't, so for us, it's not the hiring as much as it is the retention. Mm -hmm. We actually, because legal aid, we do have a very generous um, student loan repayment program, which is something that's very attractive that like district attorneys and other public defenders don't offer, but that's something that my organization offers, which has been very beneficial in keeping people. Um. I have diagnosed our, re our recruitment issues as being much in line with re of, get it, of the problem of lawyers in rural communities in general right now in Texas. Rural communities are being de depopulated with lawyers and as much as we can't get lawyers, lawyers don't move to do civil work for fees. Right now in my counties, if you are a person who lives in my county and need a divorce, you're probably waiting three weeks to get an intake appointment with a lawyer locally in order to even just talk about whether or not you might want to file. Um, and so we're, I think our recruitment problems are just in line with what is an issue in rural communities across Texas right now. Um, we don't have the infrastructure that legal aid has, but I've got the mountains and I've got Big Bend National Park. Um, I spent a lot of time talking about how it's the most wonderful place in the state to live. Um, the other part of it is a lot of my job is time investment in my lawyers. Um, it, it means that we are doing innovative training. We are spending time together talking about what's going on and what their frustration is and what's going on with the work. And it's not just handling the case, but it's losing the cases and the emotional toll that comes with being on the losing side so much. And um, it's that a lot of part of my leadership is time spent with the lawyers, and we did. We lost one of my lawyers to Texas Rio Grande Legal Aid. Uh-oh. Uh, I think stole is the verb that may be appropriate. We'll take it. Um, and, you know, we went through, I thought it was going to be, you know, a six-month process. We ended up hiring somebody within a couple weeks. Uh, now, part of that is that we have now um, through TIDC, they have sponsored a uh, council of chiefs where the chief public defenders are getting together more or less quarterly and talking about things. We have a listserv. And a lot of my applicants were generated because other chiefs around the state knew people who were looking for jobs and had ideas of people who might fit in my office because I'm going to those meetings and I'm involved there. And so the person I ended up hiring was, did come out of um, the regional defender that's run out of Texas Tech University and it was generated for me but that's it may not be it sounds a little soft but I think TIDC has been sort of key in helping me get access to people that just being on my own I wouldn't be able to. Now, he won't talk about hiring a chief but we can do that. <laughs> um, I will tell you that uh, when you set one of these up and I'm, I suspect some of you will the hiring of the chief is absolutely crucial. Um, we had five applications that we were willing, I believe it was five, that we were willing to interview. Uh, some of them had been lawyers for 40 years, DAs, defenders, incredible resumes. Uh, you've got to make sure that the person you hire shares the values of the area and the, the people putting it together. Um, you know, we, I work fast. Um, I'm very streamlined. You know, I, I feel personally involved when anyone stays in jail too long. I want, if they're innocent, they should be out from under the charge, and if they're guilty, the victim should be out from under it. So I, if they tell me I'm not guilty and I want a trial, I want it tried. I want it tried tomorrow. Um, so I needed someone that I knew would come in and not drag their feet and do everything they could to slow down, and I wanted someone that I knew when I innovated 
and tried something that no one had tried before, which we do all the time. We just make stuff up and see how it goes. Uh, I wanted somebody who was going to say yes, not wait until I can think of a reason to say no. Because uh, you all know those people. And so when we went through the interview process and we unanimously, our, over, our hiring committee unanimously chose uh, James, I believe that's one of the reasons that it has worked as well as it has. We've really had no conflict between his office and the oversight committee. I can't think of a single moment of tension except they wanted to pay more in salaries than we had money for. The committee was really into giving them raises with money we didn't have. <laughs> and, well, and you know, unfortunately, we're coming up on our hour. So, Judge Huff, do you have thoughts as well on what do you look for in leadership? <clears throat> a self-starter, a go-getter, someone that I don't have to supervise, uh, someone that is not always in my office with a problem, but comes in maybe with a solution to what they've identified. Uh, I just think a self-starter is, and they have to have heart. They have to have heart and they have to be realistic. One of the things, uh, and I'm gonna just be quiet here in a minute, but one of the things that the uh, Texas Indigent Defense Commission allows me to do, you're gonna wonder how does that fit, but what, how do, what does it allow me to do? It, it allows, I'll say, our court to have a defendant leave the courtroom with the greater respect for the judiciary. And how does that happen? That happens by having an attorney that is able to explain the process to them. They realize that they're in the driver's seat, but without that one-on-one -on -one representation, they'll plead, they'll pay a fine, they'll be on probation, and they have no idea what hit them and they're not very happy. So what is <clears throat> of value, maybe not money-wise, I think is the respect that the public or the defendants can have for the judiciary even though they plead guilty or they're found guilty. And that's very important. Well, I can't Excellent. think of a better way to conclude our panel than that statement because that is a lot of what, that's what it's about, you know. And I think, will everyone on the panel be available for questions after this? If folks have a, want to talk one-on-one, -on -one, y'all would be open to that. Sure. And of course, Edwin is here. To, he's the guru when it comes to figuring out how to submit applications to, to TIDC for funding. Myself and Scott are also available. Uh, so thank you so much. Like I said, we've run out of time here, but I really appreciate y'all taking time to listen to this important issue. Thank you.